I love lightning talks because they're so random. So come on up. We get to see like seven minutes of the best of everyone's stuff all in a row. It's really super fun. So let's start off with Clem. Come on up, man. You got seven minutes. I'll kind of sit over there. I'll kind of wave at you. I didn't make a fancy timer this year. I'm really sorry. Yeah, yeah. But for next year, I've got something super fancy underway. And the good news is I don't have to do it. So, <laughs> so here you go. Take it away. Hello. Um, I'm Clem. And I'm going to ruin your Sunday with some very serious topics. And I hopefully, at the end, will make your Sunday because we're so close on solving them all. So maybe a few of you have thought about, hey, I make my own thing, and people like it, and people would like to have one themselves, and so I'm going to sell it. Well, it's easy enough. You list it on the marketplace, like Tindy or Electrons or whatever, and then it's on the market, and people can get it, right? The thing is, when you are selling stuff, you have responsibilities, and you have obligations that you have to do. There is law involved. And Every day there's law, there's stuff you have to follow, and everybody knows you're not supposed to steal, you're not supposed to do this and that. But pretty much nobody that just makes stuff for fun knows about all the stuff you have to do when you sell products. And it's super complicated. The moment you start researching it, you find a lot of conflicting information, you find hundreds of different of regulations, and so how do they fit together? Are they even applicable to me? Oh, there are exceptions. Nice, I hope I fall into one of these exceptions. And then it turns out, no, you don't. Or maybe you do. Are you sure about that? The worst thing you can do is do nothing. That's not a statement for me. That's a legal statement for all these uh, kinds of regulations. You have obligations, and your first obligation is to know what you're doing and to be safe and transparent with it because you're only allowed to sell safe products. And the thing that is all about safety and products is CE. The European Conformity Declaration, that is, oh, its only purpose is to make sure that you're only putting safe stuff on the market. It doesn't say anything about quality, it doesn't say anything about stuff that is not considered safety relevant, but it is very important for your stuff. If you're making anything with electronics, it's very likely that you will have to deal with it in some way. So, two and a half years ago, I started selling my own stuff and I researched uh, everything about it and then I called the Chamber of Commerce and the guy on the other end told me no. <laughs> to pretty much every question I had. and. <laughs> on most of those questions, his answer was, it depends. And I said, well, but if I do it that way and if I sell it as a kid, it depends. And if I, let's say I only sell it to professionals who know what they're doing and they're only like research and development, evaluation kits, only for smart people that know what they're doing, it depends. It's always the same outcome and that is because all this stuff really depends on exactly what your product is and how it is assessed and that you have to, uh, uh, that you did follow the right procedure. So how do you do that? Uh, either you do all by yourself and you can do that. Don't let you, yourself get fooled. You can do all the stuff by yourself. Nothing in the law says that you have to involve any special laboratory, any consultants or anything else. That's not in the law, but if you try to do that, you will run into a wall most likely. I spent now two and a half years of research and I recently got certified as a CE product coordinator, which means I'm now allowed to like, tell people about this stuff and do stuff for them. And I did that for my own good, so I could sell my own products without having to pay someone else to do this. But it also means that I have to share this because the thing why I did this is because I hate it that people are basically in a legal gray area when they just want to sell a kit or two. I want a solution that makers can actually get. So now we have the problem. If you go to a consultant and you uh, say, please make this CE assessment and the risk analysis and whatever it takes to get CE, which is the first thing you have to do, what do they tell you? 5K, please. Because that's the amount that they have a lot of overhead for each project and they have to uh, get a, at least a, a specific amount of money to make it worthwhile. Okay, now here's the, the thing. How we can solve that for 
uh, basically the maker hood is we chip in together, we do a similar thing to tiny tape outs, where there's a program where you can put in your project, and then we do it all in batches. We share the overhead, we share all the running costs, and each of you gets a CE assessment that exactly tells you what you have to do. So there's a document that says your product requires this, this, and that. Here are the steps that you have to take, this, this, and that. Sign this declaration, go to market. In a way that you can understand it. Usually you get a book this thick with a lot of legal lingo that nobody understands and nobody reads it. What you would then get is a condensed version of that in actual human language that you can actually understand and apply. And if you want, that's a bit of a future thing. If you want, you can then just tick the box and say, please do these tests for me. And you get basically a turnkey solution. The way we can do this is if we chip all together in. So we have uh, basically, I will start a beta program that allows you to submit your project. If it gets accepted, there will be some, uh, some conditions like we can't do like medical devices or uh, safety critical stuff yeah, or defense. Yeah. So there will be some, uh, some restrictions to that, but you put in your project, it then gets decided what to accept and we are aiming to slash the price in fifth. So instead of 5K, it's 1K. And if you divide that across how many uh, pieces of your product you will sell in the first batch, you should recoup your investment and you're now safe. All the information is basically determined. We're pretty much at the, at the beginning of it all. Uh, the whole project has a name. It's called smander.com. I have stickers in my pocket. So if anyone wants to get a notification about the URL, you can get a sticker from me. Currently, this leads to a Discord where we already discussed the project for like two years or so. And if you're interested, let me know. We will shortly start a beta program. And I hope that this gets us all out of the legal gray area and into something where we can create safely and just share more and more projects. And maybe some of you get a new livelihood by selling awesome stuff. Thank you. Awesome. Perfect. perfect, perfect. Oh, man. Is there a password on this? Please say no. I wish. It is. Is it? Yeah. Oh, you people. <laughs> uh, we're looking for. Um, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Thanks. That was awesome. That was a perfect talk of six minutes and 20 seconds. That was lovely. And here we are up here playing with electronics. Oh, for smander.com, um, no. he's got stickers. <laughs> um, oh, yeah, escape. Well, for the love of God. Can we get this in a bigger font for people who need bifocals? <laughs> what am I looking for? Lightning. This is really mental. Oh, you guys can see it. Uh -huh. Here you go. Uh, double click, triple click. Have you ever watched a non-Mac user use a Mac? <laughs> it just works. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Which one do I want? The green one. The green one? Awesome. Let's do it. Here, come on up. <laughs> you? Uh, what's next left here? Okay, hello, my name's Segfault, and this is going to be one of those, hey, look at this cool thing I did project genders of talk, um, but uh, this is a failure, so I'm going to tell you what not to do. Um, so, uh, if anyone doesn't recognize this, this is a tracker music software. Uh, this is the old way of making music before we could do PCM and doors and everything. Uh, so back in the old days, computers didn't have enough memory to store uh, any sort of audio data at all. So you took a tiny, like, two-second slice of some vinyl that you ripped somewhere, you put in this software, and then you'd, uh, and then you'd uh, chop it up and re-pitch it, and you'd generate chiptune music. Um, this one's ProTracker from the Amiga. And uh, I am too young to have ever used this. Uh, this. This was, like, ten years before I was born. 
Uh, but I thought it was really cool. And I think that modern music making is kind of boring. So I was like, hey, I kind of want to recreate this experience. Um, so uh, I, hang on, I'm on the crib sheet here. Uh, so uh, one of the main things about these systems was they were designed, uh, 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 they were designed around chips that could not play back PCM. So they used all sorts of weird hardware tricks to make the basic waveform generators create more interesting sounds. So they'd be modulating the registers of your sound generator faster than audio rate. So every single sample that was played back by that sound chip, different set of parameters. And that was only achievable because these machines had basically no operating system, basically no hardware abstraction layers, wide 8 or 16-bit buses, and direct access to that sound hardware. So that, that raw power of your CPU, 6502, 68K, whatever, could be focused solely on driving that sound chip as hard as possible. So um, this idea in my head metastasized from, hey, let's build a tracker, or hey, let's build a sound card, to why don't I just build an 8-bit computer from the ground up? <laughs> yeah, that's, that was my first mistake. So um, what is a computer? Um, so ultimately, a computer is three things. It's a CPU, it's a RAM, and it's ROM. Obviously, we don't really think about ROM anymore in real computers, but you're all hack -a day you know what a microcontroller is, you know what flash memory is. Obviously, in a real computer, ROM is stored, uh, ROM is your BIOS chip, and that just loads data off the hard drive, and then modern real computers have a disproportionately large amount of RAM so that you can store the program and data in RAM, self-modifying code, updatable OSs, all that good stuff. But we don't care about that. We're just trying to build an 8-bit. So we need these three things. Um, so I ended up with, it. I ended up with this design. Um, so this is, this really doesn't project well. Oh, God. Uh, so this is what happens when you set no budget and go shopping on Mauser. Uh, turns out that um, nobody's made these chips for 20 years. Uh, so what you have is a micro, uh, is, is everything's a microcontroller now. So if you sit there and say, I want to build my own computer, I want my own ROM, my own RAM, my own buses, open bus architecture so I can hang whatever I want off of it, old sound chip, new sound chip. Yeah, you can't do that with a modern microcontroller very easily. So I ended up with this thing called a Zilog EZ80. Now, who here knows what a Z80 is? That's, that's good, that's good. Okay, who here knows what an EZ80 is? Oh, two, two, three, okay, cool. So basically, it's like if you take an Intel 286, but Zilog made it. So it's got 24-bit addressing, 16-meg address space and all that. Um, and basically, Zilog were trying to catch the industrial IoT market in 2000 before it even existed. So it had support for DMA and uh, 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 RMII to Ethernet before anyone actually wanted it in the tiny low-power package. They did not sell well. Then I strapped 2 megs of SRAM to it and 512K of EEPROM because those are the smallest chips you can get these days. Um, turns out SRAM's expensive. So I spent three months of my life routing this. Um, this is a mess. Don't do this. Um, so I found out, so it took, took me three attempts to get this routing of the RAM lines right. JLC's design tolerances are very good, but these pin spacings are tiny. Um, turns out if you like weave it across the layers, it sort of works. Um, but I found out after the fact that, yeah, you're supposed to put spacing between these traces. There's this thing called crosstalk. Um, so I threw money at the problem. It turns out that you can just go on JLC and you go to the impedance control tab and you go scroll all the way to the bottom and you select the, the biggest number. That means the thinnest dielectric. Uh, yeah, that makes your board cost $67 a board. And then it works. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, so this is what I ended up with. This is an EZ80 computer with two megabytes of RAM attached to it, uh, 512K of ROM, a compact flash chip uh, for loading real programs, because this is a real computer. Um, it's got MIDI. Well, it would if the microcontroller had fit, but I pulled the wrong footprint. Um, two minutes. And what I learned was, uh, yeah, don't, don't, don't do any of this. Um, so the EZ80, nobody bought it. And it was, when I, it, it was supported in the 2000s. There is a compiler for this, but it's written for Windows XP, and it's proprietary. There's no LVM, no GCC. You're screwed. Like, go write your code in, in an Eclipse IDE from 2000. No thank you. So I got a Hello World working in assembly, 
And then I realized I needed to write my own OS for a chip no one's ever used with a proprietary architecture I invented myself that doesn't make any sense. And don't do that. <laughs> so this has been Hello World the Long Way Around, or How I Learned Tools of Your Friends. What did we learn? Use the tools given to you, Rust, Python, I, Arduino, don't be a snob. Don't be like, oh, I don't need to use uh, Python. I'm not a hobbyist. Yes, you are. Unless you have 20 people dev team, you are not going to recreate the entire last 30, minute, 30 years of computation. So uh, yeah. Uh, thank you. I have the board to hand around if anyone wants to have a look. Thank you very much. Uh, Frederick Drupal. Sent you a little thing we've done like the past month about leveraging unused, unused expansion ports on real devices with really specific applications. So a little bit of context here. We at the place I work for my student job at Doctors Without Borders and the telecom units, we use uh, those kind of mobile radios on the cars in the fleet on the trains. So this is the ICF 5061D on the left, and then the newer versions of those mobile radios are on the right, the uh, 5400s, which are newer and have a lot of built-in stuff. Like, for example, you can see the backside. There are the same, like, DB25 expansion ports, but the newer one has also a tiny little SMA connector for GPS because it has built-in GPS. The other one doesn't, so what we use for the fleet is a GPS module that plugs into the back connector on the radio. and cost a bit of money, and because those uh, 50, 60, 1 radios are becoming end of life, we do not really know if the GPS modules are going to be continued to manufacture. They cost like two to 300 euros per piece, so it can be quite expensive. So we thought, well, why not use the internal headers? So this is the internal, um, an internal picture of such a board. You can see on the top uh, left, there is two little expansion ports. I have a little zoom here, if you want with a few pixels. So the left, the, the rightmost is DSP only, so it's for such a tiny module which converts the analog radio into a DPMR digital radio, so it's quite interesting to send text messages and stuff with the radio. But the um, other one is not used. It is, I, we, d we didn't find any module that used this uh, little thing, so it was reverse engineering time. We found the pinouts for the 40-pin connector, which is absolutely tiny, but we found on the like, service manuals and stuff everything you need to connect basically anything. So you can see there is also audio path signaling that you can access. There is also the RxD, TxD, so the serial data, which is quite interesting for us because the m GPS module is basically a serial GPS module like you have used with our Arduino, so your run-of-the-mill GPS module. So then we made a crude prototype with a breakout with these connectors. So there is actually two breakouts for two connectors. If you look on the motherboard, there is a, a tiny 10-pin connector above my thumb, which is labeled for GPS in the service manual. So we thought, well, why not? Actually, it doesn't work in the Japanese firmware that we use on those radio. It only works on the French version, which we have to license. So it's really complicated, so we thought, okay, let's not use that connector, let's just use the bigger one, because it's not used for anyth anything else. So we broke out all the 40 pins, even the unused ones, which was, like, you can see the NC, we still wrote, wrote them, because I don't know why. <laughs> and then we, like, soldered um, a, a AliExpress GPS module to the RX and TX lines on, on the right pins, and it worked. 
So we had a $5 GPS module for those radios that's worked. But yeah, it's from AliExpress and we can't really use that on the train because we don't know how robust those modules are. So we designed a little prototype for the production. So those are the actual modules here that we have. You can see our 3D rendering of these uh, modules with a tiny U-Blox M10S uh, module that does a GPS, GLONASS, Galileo, all fun stuff. Also, teeny tiny 0402 inductors because on the data sheet of the GPS module, it says, yes, just use this part. It will be great. And I said, OK. But then I forgot I had to ha hand assemble the first 15 prototypes. <laughs> so this was me actually assembling the, the 15 boards. Um, the, f the five first ones were a bit nerve wracking, but the next day I did, I did the 10 others and I got to a relaxing pace and a bit meditating. It was fun, actually. And fun in the madness. And then you can see the 15, the, so the 10 new ones. We did two versions, one with a little uh, battery backup, the lithium, the, so the GPS can have a little tiny lithium battery to save GPS data when you like reset the board to have a faster GPS fix. So instead of one, th 30 seconds to 45 seconds, it takes like one or two. And then we did a version without to save costs, save complexity, and save importing customs and other hassles because it's a lithium cell. So on some terrains, it can be difficult to import those, those devices. And it still works well. It just takes time to recover the signal because it forgets everything when you power recycle it. But yeah, it worked quite well right out of the box. And we basically like made a tiny pigtail with a we got a tiny pigtail with an SMA connector, a little 3D printed insert. Two minutes, thank you. And then uh, like put it next to the power cable on the backside. So we basically made, if I go back to the picture, the same radio as before. So because we have, it was interesting to do for us because we have a lot of the older generation models still in use and still that we refurbish on our own. So um, that's, that's uh, what we use the, this um, little expansion for. But there are maybe other uses for, those, um, for this connector because there's a lot of different pins that are broken out. Like I said, the audio path. So you can use an, F an FSK modem for pages. Like for example, if I can get it off my belt, those little pages, you can do an FSK modem and use such a radio as a base station to transmit messages. You can use also the RX and TX lines for internal telemetry modules to send messages or implementing other voice modes on which we will talk a bit later. So that was it. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Manuel, are you ready? Good. I have to say these guys, um, he kept saying we, I don't know if you noticed, they've completely hacked the system. The second talk is going to be a follow-up to that one. Yeah, I appreciate it. So you think the red one closes it? Turned that into my job working at the same company as Fred, so uh, our medical NGO. Um, so today I want to talk about those analog radios and how you can integrate open source digital voice modes into them. So digital voice in itself, let's go back a bit. So for decades we've been using a radio or two-way radio, you know, walkie-talkies or commercial grade systems uh, using analog modulation, AM, FM, SSB, which basically means your voice affects the RF signal, the carrier directly, modulate it. Um, now, in VHF, UHF, particularly in commercial usage, it shows its limits in terms of bandwidth usage, in terms of features. So um, now comes more and more digital modes. So basically, you're sending ones and zeros, um, binary streams, 
and you modulate it either using FSK or PSK, so you just change the phase or the frequency of the signal to transmit those uh, symbols. Um, so it's really taking over uh, the entire uh, commercial markets. And on the amateur radio world, so the experimenters world, um, it is also um, quite developed. So there are a lot of modes. I won't go into details of each, but you have in commercial, you would have DMR, NXDN, P25, Tetra. Uh, in the amateur world, uh, you would have C4FM or D-Star, and sometimes they tend to mix. So, so you can use commercial modes into amateur radio world by playing a bit with the radios. Um, but the problem with almost all of them is that they use proprietary software or hardware one way or another, very often at the voice encoder level. So if you remember what we just said before, you can send text messages, GPS positions, but you can also send voice, provided you compress it enough. And that piece of software is called a vocoder. So the vocoder very often is proprietary. Um, very often made by DVSI, so AMB was one of the mostly, uh, most used codecs. Uh, and it's still the case. Uh, so if you want to use it, you have either to pay a very expensive licensing fee, fee to integrate it into your radio, or you have to buy their custom ASIC. Uh, so commercial price, just quantity one, is about $150. So that gives the idea. Um, so if you want to experiment, so which is the basis of our hobby, uh, it makes it quite hard legally and technically. Now, M17, you might have heard of it before. Uh, actually, if you go up on hackaday.com right now in the last articles, uh, there is a piece on it. <laughs> Thanks, you. Thanks, Jenny. Um, which presents that project. So basically, it aims to make an entirely, entirely open source stack, not only the encoding part, but also the vocoder itself, uh, which is Codec 2, has been developed in the past uh, years by an Australian radio amateur. Uh, and it's outperforming some commercial modes uh, by a few decibels in some areas. Uh, so no licensing fees. You can integrate that on whichever platform you want. Uh, as long as you can just port the codec and uh, whichever you want in any microcontroller, you can make it run on anything. Uh, it has been getting quite popular over the last years. Uh, there's a big community building around it. Uh, you can do it on, uh, you can buy some Chinese radios. I'm not talking about Baofengs. Those are way too low spec, but uh, some older DMR radios, so MD380. Specifically, that can be modded to support that mode. Uh, you can use an external modem. So on, um, so on an old analog radio, you can put an external modem and transform it into M17. So that's module 17 on top. Um, now, if you go on eBay, you can buy those old commercial radios for 40, 50 bucks a piece. So they're quite cheap. And you can put them on amateur radio frequencies. They're still analog. So they're the exact same radio Fred just presented before, but this is the handset version and he presented the mobile version. So if you crack it open, you find the exact same connectors. So yeah, it breaks out uh, TX on RX, so you can pipe your modem into that. So you can have an external modem if you want with an external speaker microphone. I don't know if you can pull out the three minutes. Plenty enough. Um, but they also route the speaker and microphone. So that means that you can use the internal speaker and mic from the radio, have it pipe, pipe it through the modem, modulate the signal in M17, put it on the, the audio TXRX path, and just have everything self-contained. So yeah, we tried that. Uh, we used Fred's breakout board that he developed for Doctors Without Borders. We said, hey, might as well do you have one or two we could use? He said, yep. Yeah. So we just took one. It was a bit too big for a handset, so we would had to slice it with a paper, paper chopper. Um, luckily enough, the bottom connectors, uh, the bottom pins weren't needed. Um, and yeah, we ended up with this monstrosity. Uh, which is basically the modem just routing the audio back and forth from the radio into, well, back into itself. Um, so, yeah, we might have some time for a demo uh, a bit later on. Uh, is, is it on? I uh, know the modem is off. Your battery is off. Yeah, okay. So, yeah, you can just try it out. Nope. Demos, yay. Uh, is the UHF radio on? Nope. Nope, of course not. No, the radio is dead. Uh, yeah, check, ah. check the battery connection. It's, uh, it's disconnected. The plus, the plus side of the battery is... So, yeah, demos. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, I can, I can speak really, but yeah, it's fine. So, yeah, there you have it. Um, thank you. Um, so now, yeah, what do we do with that? Because 
we can't have it. I mean, I can have it around my belt like this, but you know, at some point it's going to get problematic. Um, and you see it already unhooked part of the connector. So you see, that's the problem. And now it's transmitting continuously because there's a pull down here, so I need to pull it up continuously. So otherwise, it keeps on transmitting. Whatever. Um, so what now? Well, we need to shrink this entire modem down into a very small module that can integrate into the radio. And we did that. So we have a design. We have a product. So we had it assembled for a layer design. We're not doing 0402s manually ourselves. So leave that to JLC. Uh, and now it just fits into the radio. Um, we have five of those. We're working on the firmware coming soon, TM. Um, and yeah, that's pretty much it. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, that's awesome. Live demo in a lightning talk. Brave, brave. Make TV, you wanna come up? just want to give a, some light on a project which is not mine. It's a project um, from Chippy Doodles, a guy from the US called Martin Knobel. Um, I'm not pay paid for this. I'm just excited about the project. And I just want to give you some insight about this uh, PCB token platform. So the idea is, we all know the PCB tokens, batches, whatever. There's always a battery on it. There's sometimes a controller on it. There are a lot of LEDs on it. And his idea is to pretty much separate the controller, battery, charging part, um, debugging part from the PCB design part. So there's a, uh, this is called the emulate platform. So there's an 80 tiny 1616 on it. There's a charger. There's one of these um, hybrid caps on it, which is some kind of uh, mix between supercapacitor and uh, LiPo. Um, there's, a con there's a boost converter on it, so you can select on your faceplate which voltage you want to have, or even there are two selectable voltages, and it's pretty much ready to go. In this case, we have six usable IOs. Two IOs are for selecting voltages and two are power supply, so we can do everything what we can do with six IOs. Um, it's all open source hardware certified. It's, you, you get KiCad files for the schematics, for the uh, PCB design, so, so you can pretty much start immediately, even if you do not have any experience with uh, PCB design, and just put one LED on it and your PCB is done, and then maybe some silk screen art or whatever. Um, but the idea is to, to make it easy to build something like this, but also to make it easy to exchange. So you can give it away at cons, you can exchange tokens without exchanging the battery controller to keep uh, bomb costs low. And also, of course, you can put you can do it fully passive or use the microcontroller to um, do some fancy stuff. And there's a second platform, larger one, more IOs, beefier MCU, a larger capacitor. But um, what I did, because I, I just asked him, please sell me one of your prototypes so can I, I can play around with this. Um, so I did two faceplates. Very simple ones, of course, but um, yeah, this caffeine a faceplate is just, I have to put it here. So this Kevin faceplate just uses all six IOs for Charlie Plexing. Yeah, just to see what's possible. It runs pretty much, yesterday I just, first time, long time test, so it runs pretty much nine hours with at least one LED is always on. Yeah, that's, that's the, the concept. And um, yeah, the other one. So in this case, I just prepared the firmware, uh, the firmware in a way that it auto detects which faceplate is on. So I'm just removing the faceplate. So that's the controller. There's a clip on the back side. So wait. So now, um, yeah, as you can see, on the back side, there's pretty much nothing. Yeah? And, this one, there are uh, two lines for I square C. So this one has a sensor on it, and the other four lines are just for um, for the LEDs, Charlie Plexed. Let's put this on. Yeah. 
And this is a um, high sensitivity um, uh, barometric pressure sensor. So if I'm just going up and going down, it just rotates clockwise and counterclockwise. And of course, if you are uh, um, using this in an elevator or escalator, it just <laughs> spins around. Yeah? And you can play with updating rate and um, all this stuff. But I really like this platform because it makes it very easy to build your own tokens. You do not have to bu uh, bu or put a lot of effort into charging, battery, whatever. You are very flexible with the voltages. And of course, you have the microcontroller to do a lot of stuff. Your, and what I really like about the platform, it's limited. So you have to work with six IOs. You have to work with uh, the voltages, with the c capacity. And um, that makes it also quite exciting. So yeah, check out his crowd supply campaign. It's in the pre-launch phase. So, uh, and there are also some, some examples just with one or two LEDs. Yeah, it's, if you want to do more silk screen stuff, more um, sensor stuff, LED stuff, whatever, it's a very flexible platform. Okay, so, yeah, and if you want to see some more about this, uh, you can also follow me on Mastodon. Normally I'm doing more addressable LED stuff, but there will also be some faceplates soon with uh, addressable LEDs, of course, because I was surprised about the battery time. Thank you very much. I'm Radomir Peralski. Uh, I go on Hackaday.io as the shipu, but uh, I'm not going to talk about my project here. I wanted to say a few words about automating things in the correct way. So we've been automating things ever since the Industrial Evol Revolution started. Basically, that's what started it, the Jacquard loom thing, uh, f you know, cheap clothes for everyone. And uh, it had profound effects on the society, on, on, uh, on capitalism, on everything. And, uh, you know, over the years we have tried many different things and we have learned uh, what works and what doesn't work and what those effects are and that they are not always desirable and things like that. But, uh, you know, recently we started automating a lot of stuff in software. We have those uh, GitHub Actions stuff, we have the CI, we have a lot of uh, uh, also like pre-commit uh, things and so on. And it seems like, you know, software developers like to learn their things on their own mistakes and they don't like to look at the history and <laughs> learn things that other people already have, uh, you know, tried. So, uh, there are certain patterns when you are automating things that that's don't really give you good things. For instance, uh, Ferdinand Ford uh, was uh, famous for, you know, the first car factory that was fully, uh, like, uh, automated in a way and uh, the real problem he had was that uh, at the time it was the car revolution everybody made their cars and the big companies that made cars uh, hired people that were building those cars in the factories and those people would work at the factory for six months for a year and then they would uh, learn how the car works how you put one together and have ideas how to improve it they would leave the company, start their own company, and they would either start to produce their own cars or they would, that were better than the ones they built, or they would modify the existing, they would sell modifications to existing like uh, mass-produced cars that improve them. And uh, like the producers didn't like that. So what they came out with was, was the factory floor, basically, where every worker only works on a tiny little bit of, of the 
process, so they don't learn the whole thing, so that there is no uh, danger of them going on, on their own. And uh, we, we see that with software as well, right? We, we, we have narrow specializations where we, where we uh, only do the one thing. We only, I only administer the Nagios server, and I don't touch the, the email server at all, or things like that. So, yeah, that's one thing. Second thing, remember when there was elevators had a driver? There was an elevator boy who would actually drive the elevator, and the elevator wouldn't stop automatically at the right level. The driver had to actually stop it at the exact right moment for, for the elevator to floor to be level. We automated that away, right? But the elevator boy actually had more functions. You could ask him where someone lives. He would remember if, if the person was there or if he went home already and so on, so on, we lost that. By placing those buttons in there, we lost a lot of uh, functionality. So this is a, a pattern. Washing machine can only wash uh, certain clothes. We don't wear clothes that washing wash machines can't wash anymore. Dishwashers and so on, we can think about it. Next thing, automation is kind of moving work around. It's not, a it's not doing work for us. You still have to work on the automation itself. You, you have to make that battery that you put into the robot for the robot to work. So it kind of hides the work away. So there are people making batteries in one place and there are people using those batteries in the other place. So it's very easy, sorry, that's the wrong. Uh, it's very easy to have like a uh, hide and labor where you, you have a, a robot delivering your food to you so you don't have to interact with people, but that robot actually is controlled by people. You just don't have to interact with them. Uh, next anti-pattern, a uh, Robocop, where you don't actually automate the work, you just automate the checking if the work has been done, and the work is still has, has to be done by the people. That's a really bad way of, so I submit a pull request and it's rejected because the imports are not sorted alphabetically. That's just stupid, right? The computer can sort them perfectly well. Why do I have to do it? Uh, and the last thing I want to say, talk about is automating things that you enjoy doing. Don't do it. If you enjoy it, do it yourself. And, uh, you know, if, it, if it's a positive thing in a community, for instance, it's a simple task that uh, people learn on, so it brings more people to the community, don't automate it, because then you will run out of new people. Uh, okay, thank you. And lastly, don't make robots, don't make robot slaves, make tools. Thank you. Yeah, I'm Fatih. Um, I work for Ambition. It's a Mercedes-Benz company. We in automotive. We provide the infotainment system for Mercedes cars. And uh, I want to talk about today about, about STVs. Have you ever heard about STVs? Oh, okay. <laughs> this is the next big thing, probably in automotive. STV is a software-defined vehicle. Um, and um, yeah, I just want to give you a short introduction to STV. And what is possible with that? So what is actually a software-defined vehicle? Um, nowadays, I mean, cars are quite difficult to up. I mean, to, to introduce new features in cars is quite difficult. I mean, you have a lot of ECUs in the car. And these the ECUs do specific functionalities. 
But um, if you want to introduce a new feature, it's quite hard because you have to update certain ECUs at the same time. There is a tight coupling and, and it's very hard. And um, the software defined vehicle, the goal of one of the goals of the software defined vehicle is um, to keep the software always fresh in the car from the whole life cycle, from first day until the last day, like your um, smartphone. Um, this is providing new features, for example, updating functions, uh, fixing bugs, um, collecting data to improve the usability, also um, um, providing backend services, for example, to make uh, life easier for drivers. Um, this is in short, so to say, software behind vehicle. Um, so what is needed actually for that? Um, we need connectivity. This is very important um, that you have 24-7 uh, connected cars. Um, over the air connectivity, this is a big issue, especially in German um, car makers. <laughs> um, Tesla, for example, is quite uh, advanced in this, uh, um, in this area. And you need also to um, manage your software version, your hardware version. Um, there are a lot of variants of sensors, actuators, and so on, and it has to be safe and secure, actually. Because um, car is, uh, um, a car has safety-relevant uh, components, and you have to do all this stuff very in a safe way. Um, yeah. Is it this? OK. I, just a short uh, uh, overview about the architecture, which is uh, there at the moment. I mean, the, on the left-hand side, you see the domain architecture. This is actually how uh, cars are at the moment. You have these big boxes. These are um, mm, the big ECUs with certain functionalities, like uh, lights, uh, for lights, for uh, infotainment system, for um, ADAS systems, advanced driver assistance system, and so on. It's very um, distributed and very tightly coupled. And therefore, if you want to introduce a new future, feature in this uh, architecture, you have to update multiple devices at the same time. And this is a very challenging um, issue at the moment. And uh, experts on this domain say, okay, we have to change this domain architecture to a sonal architecture. This is uh, a slide from Vector Informatics. I mean, this is a company very famous in automotive. Um, you see the car is divided in different zones, uh, front, back, uh, left, and um, right. And all smaller actuators and sensors are connected to the zone controllers, so to, uh, so to call zone controllers, these green boxes. And in the middle, you have a backbone of uh, so-called HPCs, high-performance computers. I mean, um, if you are familiar with, uh, with ECUs at all, ECUs, electronic control units, these are embedded systems, very limited um, capabilities. It's passive cooled, and uh, therefore you cannot um, uh, introduce um, um, features which need a lot of compute, uh, compute power. Usually it's quite limited. And this HPC, this um, level box, uh, yellow back boxes, these are um, quite pof powerful micro uh, processors, not microcontrollers. You, usually you have in ECUs microcontrollers. And a uh, lot of RAM, and you, you have a lot of uh, other uh, fancy stuff there, like GPUs and so on. Um, and um, and these yellow boxes will be updatable, because your f uh, the main features like infotainment system, ADAS, advanced driver assisting system, and so on, and all these complex uh, features will run on. Oh, something happened? <laughs> ah. Don't ask me. Ah, OK. Okay, and the whole magic happens in these yellow boxes. And uh, if the car is uh, completely connected to the cloud, 24/7, um, and you have these HPCs, you can do a lot of things with that. I mean, um, you can in, in a car usually you have up to 100 sensors. This is, uh, I mean, car is really full of sensors, and you can there are a lot of the data coming out of the sensors. And um, I think. This architecture has a lot of potential for hacking, hacking uh, on a car. I mean, uh, because these yellow boxes uh, use um, AutoSAR adaptive. I'm not sure if you're familiar with that. This is a, um, um, some kind of uh, architecture. Um, AutoSAR, uh, AutoSAR is a standard in automotive. There are classic and adaptive. The classic one is, is, is a topic. I mean, this is, I don't want to talk about that, but the adaptive one is, um, is Linux-like. I mean, the, 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 there is an operating system which is very Linux-like. You can apply, okay. You can um, deploy many, many uh, um, 
PC-like um, applications on, on this um, AutoSAR adaptive uh, stack. And therefore, I think uh, I call this kind of uh, architecture um, a vehicle cloud. I mean, if this is completely connected uh, and you have these HPCs, these are moving, uh, moving uh, yeah, this is a moving vehicle cloud, actually. You can do a lot of things with the data provided by the sensors. And I think um, it could be quite interesting. I don't know how this de will develop. I mean, this kind of ar architecture at least is not uh, there at the moment in place, but hopefully in the next five to 10 years. And uh, what you can do is, I mean, you can actually deploy um, applications on uh, these devices, connect this to your smart home. The, the, the car would be part of your smart home. You can use all the sensor data to, I don't know, whatever you want. I mean, you can, there are GPUs. You can uh, uh, live uh, um, train your ML um, models on the, on the devices, you know? I mean, from the, um, from the sensors. I mean, you don't need to collect them and then train. You can, during the drive, you can, you can even uh, train your uh, machine learning um, applications. And I think this is quite interesting um, um, yeah, use case. And I just wanted to present this. Um, so there are some, some resources there. I mean, there's a STV report, quite interesting if you want to learn more. Um, there are in industry um, initiatives like SOFI, Coveza, Eclipse Foundation. Um, they have uh, software behind vehicle initiatives. They also provide some uh, prototypes and also implementations if you, if you like. Just uh, check out, uh, there is a LinkedIn group I uh, moderate on uh, about software defined vehicle. If you like, you can join. There are my contact data. That's it. being able to read what I'm doing. Okay, so two years ago, uh, I saw someone named Repeated Failure published uh, this QR code. <laughs> You'll recognize it as the Rick Roll. <laughs> and um, so being a fan of, of programming in processing uh, with, uh, this is Dan Schiffman, Elliot. This is the, the guy I talked about yesterday. He's you know, very a lot of fun. I like programming and processing a, a lot. Um, so having seen, you know, a lot of stuff that people do with processing, uh, video uh, processing, um, uh, I, I wondered, could the live QR code, could it actually be a live webcam video? Um, so yeah, I, I, that's, that's what I tried. And, and the important thing here is, of course, can you create a live QR code that is constantly moving and yet still be scannable. So um, <clears throat> it took me a while, but let me present to you. There you go. Which hard to. Uh, so I asked someone, where's Dave? Dave? Oh, here you are, here you are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I asked Dave to be my test subject. Uh, yeah, I think this, this works pretty well. There, yeah. <laughs> So, yeah, exactly, yeah. So, uh, it depends how well it works. Uh, it depends on lighting and uh, because you need a high contrast. And, um, uh, but yeah, it should be scannable from about 10 times the width of the whole thing. That's apparently in the spe specifications. Uh, so yeah, try it out. It should work from at least, well, let's say 10 meters. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, so this should go to the GitHub repo for, th for this project. Um, so I'll explain uh, for your amusement how this works, uh, if 
the whole thing works still on my laptop. So this should, yeah, this is what a normal QR code looks like. And the trick is uh, that my living QR code doesn't require, so basically this is a scan, a hack of the way the scanner in your phones work. So uh, actually the, f the phones, the, the scanners, they only use, mm, see here goes my, uh, uh, there you go. Uh. This is actually what your scanner needs. So those squares in QR codes, they are actually uh, little grids of three by three squares, and the scanner only looks at the middle one. Right? So the, all the other stuff around it, you can just fill up with noise, which is what I did here, and then also with video, and then I use different types of uh, dithering. So this is still, still Dave. <laughs> there you go. All right. So I suppose, yeah, it, it does work better if you're sure. Yeah, Dave is still visible, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's okay. I mean, I don't want you to. Yeah. There you go. Just, yeah, you're all in the QR code. You are the QR code. That's what I added. You are what you scan. I thought that would be fun. Um, so um, what am I saying with that? So th actually, the noise and the dithering of the image really help to create the illusion that everything's moving all the time. when Remember, there's still the same QR code in, in view for your scanner all the time. So it's actually, it's a trick. It's a, it's a bit of a hack. So yeah, uh, there's a bit of a wish list that I uh, still would like to um, include. Let's go back to my, huh? Sorry? What happens when you put in a QR code? What happens when you put in a QR code? Yesterday, there were people who asked, can I encode the image in the QR code? Which I think you could though. I think you could have an image, but then you would need a large resolution QR code to encode the image. Yeah, I think it could be done. We're gonna try that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know. Already people were uh, suggesting feature requests, and uh, yeah, so I'll, I'll get there. Um, so yeah, the, the, the other uh, to-do list, uh, I, I would like to have full screen video, right, where the QR code is just one square in the middle. I think that could be visually fun. QR goes uh, bigger than 29 by 29. Color. Color should be interesting. Uh, it should be possible. The scanners, they first make any image uh, grayscale. So you could add color, but you'll have to use the HSL palette, right, instead of RGB, because you'd have to make sure that the contrast is big enough between lights and darks. And then it should be possible. I'm, I'm, I'm definitely going to try that one. Some people have already, already done that sort of thing, uh, but then basically this is cheating. The more, more a matter of using the dithering rather than, uh, the, and, and maybe also the um, uh, redundancy in QR codes. So you'll note that my trick doesn't use, um, or rather the, the people who thought of this first, the, the trick they use implemented it does not rely on the redundancy, right? It's, there's, the redundancy is only there for maybe when a scanner, when the resolution is not high enough. I don't know, it, it, it just only relies on just keeping those middle dots in. Um, yeah, so uh, color and, well, if you have any, th if you want to help with this, if you think this could be fun, if you want to use it yourself, this is the GitHub. Uh, and uh, yeah, that's, that's also what this, what, where this brings you. There you go. That's my badge. Speaker, speaker, speaker. Okay, so uh, I, yesterday I showed this little um, add-on that I made. And um, I basically made that because I thought, hey, oscilloscope music is pretty cool. I wonder what it takes to put it into the badge. And 
Yeah, so, so um, I had a bootleg version as well. So when SuperCon was announced and uh, they published the files on GitHub, I made my own version and I got my badge before everybody else had. That was pretty nice. But then I r didn't really do anything with it. Uh, yeah, but um, I, I talked to Elliot uh, at Congress about um, maybe having a little adapter so you can play oscilloscope music on the badge. And uh, I thought, like, I can just add a little connector and be done with it. And he was like, no, you probably need, like, an op amp. And I was like, oh, crap, op amps. Never done anything with those. Uh, because I'm self-taught, and when you can choose what you learn, you don't want to learn about op amps, I guess. <laughs> uh, yeah, but uh, I did learn some things. And uh, yeah, maybe let's just ignore the subtitle. I was a bit petty when I wrote this. <laughs> so. <laughs> Uh, this is the end result, uh, and yeah, you can maybe see the botched uh, resistors up there. Um, that's I, I'll get to those, but um, I basically made this little op amp design, um, which allowed me to then display the music on the batch. And what's actually oscilloscope music? If you haven't heard that, that's basically uh, you use both channels, or like the left channel and the right channel for your ears, the music. Uh, to draw an image on an XY oscilloscope. So, kind of, I don't know, should have presented something and you can see that, but anyways. Um, so, <laughs> when I used a 3.5 connector and just put it in there, this is what I saw. Basically nothing. Uh, there's like some little green specks up there, that's uh, when the music was very loud. Um, but basically, um, the audio signal is in a range between minus one volt and one volt. So, when you want to display something on the batch, uh, the batch has the range of zero volt to three volt in both axes. So, yeah, and also it's round, so you don't really see the upper corner. Uh, yeah, and it was basically cut off, and you don't see it. So, the solution for this would be a summing amplifier. Basically. Um, you can follow the link, it much better explains how op amps work, I don't really know it. I just have made a big, huge Excel sheet and then tried to find out the best uh, resistor values to um, first amplify the voltages, and then, um, yeah, you, you first have to shift them into the middle of uh, zero and three volts, and then basically also have to amplify it so that you can see it. And. Yeah, then I ran into a different problem. Um, I used the LM358 as an op amp. That's basically, even if you don't work with op amps, you, you kind of have one at home. It's on a module somewhere, or um, you, you have it in, in the drawers for, for the day when you build an amplifier that you never built. But yeah, anyways, I used that one for the batch for a prototype. I have no idea why I'm, yeah, yeah, that's fine. Thank you. Um, so uh, when you use the um, amplifier for this um, and power it with three volts, you don't get three volts out again. That's the basic thing. So, so you get a cutoff picture. And what that did to, uh, to the batch was basically you had this little corner where you only saw the image and then there was like this much blank. And there's two solutions for that. Uh, the one I tried with my breadboard thing was that you just use um, something that boosts up the voltage to five volts just for the op lamp, uh, for the op amp, so you can reach the three volts to display it on the display. But there's also another thing that you can get. Uh, it's op amps that are called rail to rail. They reach uh, the voltages that you put in in both directions. So rail to rail just means the zero, the ground rail, or if you work with negative voltages, and then whatever you have on the upper voltages. So uh, then <laughs> I ran into another problem, and uh, this one was kind of working on me because uh, I noticed that the y-axis was inverted. So uh, yeah, so first of, uh, um, I was like, okay, I have this bootleg badge, maybe I did something wrong there. And I kind of checked and I ordered the same stuff they did, so I was like, ah, no, no, not really. And they wouldn't just botch something on 400 badges, never, just to make it work, like a diode or something. Uh, anyways, so yeah, I was like thinking, ah, oh, maybe my MacBook does something weird. We all hate Apple. Apple can be weird, whatever. Uh, but it, that wasn't the case. Uh, I checked on my oscilloscope. 
And right, bootleg, we had that. And uh, maybe uh, because I ripped off the display from a module, I was like, okay, maybe it was initiated wrong. But then again, my menu was the right way, so that couldn't be it really. Uh, so then I was like, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask on Discord. Maybe somebody else noticed. And uh, someone <laughs> was, like, <laughs> was like, hmm, I thought it was uh, so that low voltages was physically low on the screen. I'll have to check that out for you. I don't think you checked yet. I, maybe. No. No time for it. That's completely fine. Uh, yeah, and it would be strange if I had it inverted. And uh, yeah, so it has to work like an oscilloscope. And somebody else was like, oh yeah, Elliot, you totally did. Oh, sorry, Elliot. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, but then um, I um, took it to the internet once again and uh, I made a little plan because when you want people to test something and you just say something like, oh, I think it's this and that, then uh, it's not that easy for them to test. But I thought like, maybe I can just connect two wires and for the Y channel, just connect ground. And then somebody on the internet was like, oh yeah, mine does the same, and it was a Supercon badge. So that kind of, uh, yeah, nailed it down for me. And uh, BitLooney also said like, I think it was, ground was up. And uh, it seems like nobody on Supercon cared to tell Elliot. Okay. Uh, so he was like, no, somebody would have said that, but I think like every hacker was just like, okay, it's every account, okay, just invert it, and then it works. Uh, yeah, so. Um, what I had to do and didn't have time for the thing was learn about differential amplifiers with op amps, which is basically uh, I used the signal on the inverted input so I can invert it and then uh, push it in the right direction to zero to three volts. And then that worked on my batch. Yeah, and uh, right, invitation, um, I'm uh, you can find me in, at the Exxon Hack and Make Space. That's the address. Uh, we'll also go there when this is uh, over, so you can come and uh, see the space and the others on my socials. Thank you. That wasn't. That wasn't. submitted this after the talk started, so um, great job to get that in. Um, I appreciate it. Okay, cool. So I want to talk to you for a couple minutes about our request for making uh, repeatable solder pasting. Um, I run a little company and we do a lot of uh, circuit board assembly in-house, and so um, we do prototype things like one piece, but we also do 100 pieces or 1,000 pieces, and we're using a lot of really small stuff. So we use, basically like eight years ago, we decided we we're going to just do everything with 0402 parts and QFN because that was industry standard for normal like production in China. Um, we lived in China, so it was really easy. We could just go to the factory next door. Um, but that also meant that like, uh, everything has to be really exact. And um, we keep trying to make smaller and smaller things. So now, like, when we want to make really tiny parts, like a um, really small, like this is, this is a board that has a, a RP2040 on it. And you have to include a little um, memory chip with it now. Um, but you can't have a whole full-size memory chip, because that would just make your part twice as big. So we switched to using these smaller and smaller memory things. And then like, the top left corner, uh, this little guy here is a, a little voltage regulator, a 3.3 volt voltage regulator, right? And so this is like what parts are nowadays, and if you want to use new parts, that's what it is. But it means solder pasting is really, really more and more difficult. Um, yeah, so quickly, uh, this is what the PCB assembly process is, if you haven't seen it before. Um, probably you did. But we get a bunch of boards. Um, these boards are easy to make because they're all like huge, just LED boards. So they're not really a problem, but you do that. Then you add a bunch of solder paste to it. Um, by Generally, you have a stencil. You could either have this like cut stencil or one in a frame. Um, and then you place the components. We have a little desktop pick and place machine. This machine is worth about 4,000 euros. It's pretty good. It's not worth more than that, but yeah, it's great. Um, <laughs> we, actually, we can actually reliably do like 0402 parts on these um, by just running it slowly. And we had to write our own system for like generating the files to run on it to make them be consistent enough. But, now that we spend a bunch of time banging on it, we can run it and we can run like 100 pieces of something. Um, 
we never run like a major commercial project on this uh, for like the actual runs, but for doing prototypes that we're sending to a fab later, that's fine. Um, and then we heat things carefully. Right now we use hot plates. Um, we've tried little reflow ovens, we don't like them. Um, I really would like to get one of the uh, vapor phase ovens, but we don't have that. Um, if anyone wants to like, show me one, I'd love to actually try it. Um, and then of course you have to test the parts afterwards. Um, okay, but mostly the problem was, uh, in all this process here, we've gotten everything else good, but our solder paste technique was just bad. Um, and so uh, normally if you're doing prototyping, you have frame stencils, and you can get those in like a, reason, I mean not really cheap, but maybe a two or 300 euro jig, that just, it's basically like a thing with a hinge that folds down. Um, and those work fine. If you're doing bigger parts, like a 805 parts, um, and we use a lot of uh, LEDs that are 2835 sized, um, works perfectly fine for those sizes, it's okay. Um, but once you start doing smaller things, the, every single tolerance in the mechanical thing just is bad, and like, if you take a hinge and just move it a little bit, you get half a millimeter or a millimeter of slop, and then that's bigger than the part we're using now, so um, it's not very great. Um, of course, there's the, uh, the like, basic like, idea of just um, taking a bunch of PCBs that you already have, taping them down to your desk, and then sticking it down. That works really well, um, it, but it's like, it gets old after a couple years, um, and if you're doing multiple things, it's not great. Um, and then the pro method would be to buy this like solder paste printer. So if you go to any like um, manufacturing fairs, you can see there's these companies that make, uh, they basically have like inkjet or solder paste jet heads, um, and they can print like uh, almost at production speeds this quality machine. But those are like a quarter of a million euros. So we don't have one of those. Um, <laughs> if someone wants to give us one, I'd love to uh, try it. I'll definitely post about it, right? Um, okay, so, <laughs> yeah, and so these are, we've looked at a couple different kinds of things, like um, we bought, my partner Hong Hong uh, is a sourcing wizard, and she finds all these things on Taobao, um, and there's a bunch of companies in China making endless variations of little stenciling jigs, um, and they all work kind of well, and they're all kind of right, but they're all really broken, and like, um, it's difficult, so, um, yeah, so we tried, originally there's, like on the left side here, there's these um, reball tools, they're actually designed for making BGA part reballs, um, and they're very accurate, and you can put a PCB, like we built a bigger one of, we took one of those apart, took all the parts off of it, and built a bigger version to do stenciling um, with PCBs. Um, and that actually is really accurate, but the problem is you have to have a stencil designed very carefully, and so anytime you send it off to like a little prototyping house, they don't wanna make you a stencil that's exactly this big with exactly these holes in it, um, or they can, but it's extra work, um, so it didn't really work very well. And then like, we found these ones here that are also cheap, but, um, they're not accurate, like they're, again, like you just hold it and you twist it a little bit and your board's totally misaligned. Um, yeah, and so uh, other things we do for making big boards, we found that um, basically the solution to making stencils high quality, or like high quality stenciling is just stick everything down to a single piece of material. Um, so we're making really large, this is a 500 millimeter board we, have, we were setting up, and um, we found that we, we just stuck things to the sides of the frame um, and like basically drilled everything into a piece of wood then you could get everything very accurate. Um, and we could do, we were making these 500 millimeter boards that have QFN and 042 parts across the board. Um, and we we're doing a prototype run of like 50 of these, and we actually could get, we had like one defect out of all of those, so that's reasonable. Um, and so um, the other thing we found, like kind of based on that idea, is we came up with this idea of just making a piece of metal um, that uh, has a frame on it, and then slider pieces uh, to work. And so we're calling this a solder paster, so this is a new, thing that we made up. Um, and it lets you do like uh, one-sided boards with very high um, precision. Um, you can't do a second side because on the inside of it, it's just a piece of metal. So if you flip it over, the parts don't fit. But usually when we're doing a board, the most important parts are on one side, and then there's like a couple caps on the other side, so it's not a huge deal. Um, yeah, so we just made up this design here, and we've um, been running it a little bit. Um, basically, it works like any kind of jig. You put your PCB in, and then you slide everything together. Um, and uh, yeah, we found it works pretty well. Um, so uh, yep, we're going to, uh, we have more information up here, and um, yeah, we're working on it as a tool. So yes, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Daniel, come on up. Let's see, you are on this one. Yes. Hey. Yeah. Should be here. Last one, see it? Last one? Last one. Lovely. Yoo-hoo! Man, I'm getting good. All right, take it away. All right.
right, thank you. Um, yeah, so my name is Daniel, and I want to talk to you about a way I devised uh, to make wiring documentation easier and prettier for your projects. Because let's face it, um, oftentimes for documenting your PCBs, you have great tools. Doesn't matter if you use like Altium, Eagle, or, or KiteKeyCAD, even open source tools provide like perfect documentation tools. But uh, whenever you're working on multi board designs or you're building robots that include any wires, Oftentimes, what I've seen both in hobby projects but also uh, in professional environments is that the wiring documentation kind of sucks. So some people document their wiring with some Excel table, just matching, OK, this pin goes there, but it's not very nice to read. And as soon as you have more than just one-to-one -one wiring, it's a bit complicated. Sometimes people just bust out paint. Um, this is one of the prettier, one, prettier ones I've seen. Uh, but it's very hard to modify. It's not straightforward to read. And if you want to change something, it's also not very easy to version control. Some people abuse stuff like, for example, KiCad. Uh, you can, of course, draw some lines and some rectangles. But then in the end, it's also kind of like using paint because it's not the tool for the job. So the labels don't really mean anything. Uh, yeah, And you're just pushing around rectangles and lines, which is not the way you want to be spending your time. Or you have maybe access to SolidWorks Electrical or some other fancy uh, tool, which gives you much nicer results, uh, but maybe costs, I don't know, thousands or tens of thousands uh, for licensing. So not really great for the hobbyist, especially. So I came up with a little project of mine. Uh, I call it WireViz. It's a little Python application. So I'll just show you how it works. And you can figure out if this is something that might help you in your next project. So we just started with a uh, YAML formatted text file. And we're going to start to describe our connector. Um, so this is just a hello world kind of example. So we're going to just take one connector on the left, one on the right, run a cable between it, that's it. But this, this can scale um, very easily. OK, so we want to describe first what connectors do we have. So let's call the first one x1. Let's say it's a Molex connector. Um, you can add some additional information. Is it the plug? Is it the receptacle? And it's three pins. This is like the, the bare minimum information that you might want to have. Then you, we have a second pin. Let's say this is a different type of connector. Um, it's also a plug. And now instead of just saying, OK, it's three pins, we can add a bit of information on, OK, what do these pins actually do? We can give them some labels. So instead of saying, OK, it's got three pins, we just give it a list. Um, we call the labels ground, transmit, receive. I think, uh, yeah, we've all been there. So this describes the, the endpoints of our cable. Now we just continue. Uh, the next section, let's describe the, the wire, the, the cable itself that's going to uh, run between them. So let's call this T1. Um, so we need three wires. We need to define a length. That's helpful if we want to actually document how this is built and we want to maybe allow someone else to build more of them. Um, what wire gauge? It's kind of in interesting information. So let's say 0.25 uh, square millimeters. Maybe we want to share this design across borders, also to the US, where they use American wire gauge. So we can just say, OK, just show also the equivalent in, in AWG. Um, then we can add some little more additional information. So for example, the cable's gray. You know, if, if things start getting complicated, uh, this is very helpful. So this would be the, the color of the actual cable itself, the outer uh, shielding, or, or sheathing, rather. And then the individual wires inside this cable, we can define the colors individually, or we just say, OK, maybe this is this following the DIN 47100 standard. So like first wire is white, second is brown, third is green, et cetera. Um, in this case, we don't even need to, to memorize the standard. We just say, OK, it's, it's DIN code. We can add some, some other information, for example, manufacturers, um, part numbers. We can also add supplier information um, and some graphics info. Um, so for example, in this case, maybe the connectors, it makes sense to give them some names to reference them later. But if it's just one cable, we just say, OK, we, we don't even need to show this name in the final results. So, so now we've got the parts. Uh, but they're not hooked up yet. So the third section of the file is just called connections. In this case, we only have one connection, so it's not going to be very exciting. But as I said, this, this can easily scale. Um, so let's run a wire from connector x1, pin 1, 
via the cable C1, the first wire, to connect it uh, X2 to the pin labeled ground. This is pretty straightforward. Um, and now we just do the same for the next wire. So we just add to the list. So pin two via uh, wire number two to the RX pin. And then, yeah, third pin, third wire to the transmit pin. And so this basically describes what we want to build. So uh, WireViz, as I said, is just a Python uh, command line tool. So we just run it, give it the, um, the YAML file that we just created, and it spits out, among other things, a nice graphical uh, uh, representation of our cable, which is maybe a bit unusual at first, but um, yeah, if you've worked with this for five minutes, it's quite easy to read. So you see one connect on the left, the other on the right, the cable between them, there's the, the most important information within each connector. And in the wire, when things get complicated, it's quite, quite helpful to see, okay, this wire uh, goes to pin number one on X1, uh, ground, AKA pin number one on X2, et cetera. And here you also have pin numbers that are just auto-generated. You can also customize this and the labels that you assigned. So you can imagine if you have a, um, for example, a 3.5 millimeter audio jack, maybe the pins would not be called like one, two, three, but it could be tip, ring, and sleeve. So you can also redefine these names and still also have the, um, the functions separate from the pin names. So this is just a very basic example. Um, yeah, this tool helps you because your input is just text-based, so it's really easy to edit. Um, it's easily versionable in Git or whatever you use for, for version control. All the graphics is auto-generated. You don't need to worry about layout. Um, you might have noticed the, the name WireViz um, is related to GraphViz. Maybe you had, have, had to use this in your thesis at some point. Um, and uh, so yeah, that's, that's what's taking care of all the graphic layout here. Has some fancy features like the, um, the color codes, the conversions. It generates a little bill of materials and you can add some graphics uh, around it as well. Uh, you can have templates and of course it's, it's open source. So in my last seconds, I'll just show you a bit more complex example so you can see what the tool can do. So here you see like multiple connectors, multiple wires running from it. Um, in this case, the connector is going to the Raspberry Pi. So I, I'm just showing not just the connector itself, but also the, the Pi um, header that it's connected to. I can add some information here, see which signals go where. Um, I can add additional components to the wires, for example, some heat shrink. Um, or it will also auto-calculate how many crimps I need for the wire. If I tell, okay, um, this is the type of crimp, just multiplied by the times of, uh, times the connect number of connections that I have on this pin. Um, yeah, you get like a little fancy um, title block for metadata and the bill of materials that you can export and uh, yeah, put into your ERP system if you have it or just, yeah, just your shopping cart. Um, and that's it, thanks. That's super. Thanks. That's a really cool looking tool. Um, let's see, Bart, you want to come up? Help me with this. Yeah, can you, you can remember the link, I'm sure. I just minimized it. Oh, for the love of. How do we do that? Do you know how to open a browser? Good. Just click on what? That's this one, the compass. Yeah, totally. Thank you. It's gonna be oh great arrows. I'm fast forwarding quickly because I don't want to give you the full half an hour talk. I mean I can. All right. It 
probably start here. Uh, a while ago, somewhere in 2020, suddenly I had a lot of time on my hands because every event got cancelled for some weird reason. And well, this talk is about, I don't like to, I uh, will skip that one. I don't like measuring things. When I'm measuring things, it feels like I'm working. I like building things. You probably had it before where you build an electronics project, so you take some parts, you put it all together, you look on your desk and you go like, that fits in a box. You look around, you grab a box, you shove it in, you go like, yeah, that's it, that works. Uh, that's how I like to build my furniture. Um, so, to build a workbench, I needed a workbench. So I took four pallets, screwed it together, put some caster wheels under it, and I had the bootstrap workbench. I could then start designing the actual workbench. Uh, there's this nice, uh, this is nice, wouldn't call it wood factory. They sell a lot of wood in bulk, and what they consider junk, they put out next to the big gate at the street. And my favorite place to drive past, because they throw away pallets and they throw away nice, really quality wood, because it has a better quality wood on top of it. And I found this nice American pallet, which is rather rare in Europe. And I thought, hmm, that like a, that's the perfect workbench tabletop. So you can see here at the bottom, and you can see that I don't like measuring things. So what is the perfect height? Well, you put down the tabletop on the floor. You start stacking crates and boxes and whatever crap you have lying around that looks like it has the same measurement until you reach the perfect height. And then you put another pallet on top. I shimmied some wood in between. I didn't measure it. I went like, that fits, that fits. You saw it off. And the way to build things without not having to measure is making sure that when you build a piece of wood, make sure there's always one side that it can freely stick out. That means you can just draw a little line, put it, chop it, saw it, and you're done. Or better yet, you just screw it in and then you take another saw and you do it manually if you have the time. And you end up with this. Surprisingly, without measuring, it's perfectly nice and water level. So now I had the beginning to continue my next project, which was, we can't really go outside a lot, and that sucks. But at the back of my apartment, you can see the emergency route is somewhere, I'm not sure if you can see my mouse, somewhere right here, and we had to keep the left part free, because it's the roof of my neighbors. But they're pretty chill people, they're a bank, surprisingly for chill people, and they were like, yeah, as long as you're not blocking the emergency exit, sure, you can put a terrace down. Just make sure you put down the protective plastic feet, which are really affordable. But turns out they have this really expensive wooden square tiles for terraces. And I thought, well, that just seems ridiculous. I could just get Euro pallets. They have a deposit. They're like five euros a piece, and you can return them. So when I move out. I'll just return the pallets. Yes, I did treat them so they wouldn't rot in winter. And I had a bunch of junk pallets. And those pallets in particular, when I saw them lying around, I looked at them and said, this looks like the back of a bench. When you walk in the park, those, those, out of those three, those two horizontal lines, it reminded me of a bench. So later on, I made a bench with it, but again, I don't like measuring things. So you just repair a pallet with leftover stuff. You put down the piece of wood. You saw along the line. I now have a tabletop. You can see that I try leaning back on it. It's like, eh, might work. So you find the perfect height. The perfect height is, of course, in the most typical unit that you use. You can use it as payment. It's a crate for drinks. You can use that as a weight. I weigh, on average, around three crates. I tested it on a seesaw. Or you can use it as a height. And then works perfectly fine. Uh, same thing, I needed a bench. So how do you calculate the angle? You lean back, you go like, yeah, that works. You draw a little line, you flip it over, you balance it carefully on some crates, and you just screw the whole thing together. What's the perfect height for sitting? It is, of course, a crate. So you just add another crate. You attach some legs to it. You screw it all together, glue it all together, and you have a nice garden set. 
and then you put it outside, you add some plans to it, and that's how I build a terrace without getting a single tape measure out. If you need... Oh, quick, quick announcement on... Quick announcement on Bart's behalf. got stripped out and I was like if I'm really doing the wiring in the kitchen I can also do all the rewiring in my home and I run cables to all of the lightning at the ceiling and all of the switches and I was like that's perfect I've run them all the way to the fuse box so when I'm moving out I can just connect them and the next one I'll have it in then I'm over there and we're working is fine but for me I want to have a smart home so I got a Raspberry Pi and I built an AO extender it's a really crappy solution in their first iteration. Uh, I got a 74HC595. It's just a serial to parallel I.O. extender. It can be powered by 5 volt. I got that from Raspberry Pi. Uh, it runs the 3.3 volt signals. So I got eight channels out there. I got some SSD relays and hooked them up to the lightnings. And it works just fine. I run the solution for like two years, and then I was like, I know how to use KiCad now. Let me design my own PCB. And the first thing I did was, of course, get this shit out and do it properly. Um, so I did it. And uh, I got the ESP32, put ESP Home in there, got two IO port expanders, and uh, put then a correct isolation in there. The bottom right corner, uh, bottom left corner are uh, opto air couplers, so I can run 24 volts on all my switches. The switches go in there, go to the IO expander, the uh, ESP Home reads it in and says, oh, the switch is toggled, I should also toggle the lightning. Toggles the uh, other IO expander on the top. This one targets uh, the Darlington resistor array, which then toggles the uh, relay, the SSD relay, and the light turns on. So a really easy solution, and I really like the problem, but it also is like, I go to so many homes where the people are like, oh, we've got the light switch here there, but don't use it, I've got the hue switch next to it, please only use the hue switch, never use the lightning switch. I was like, I hate that. I want to use the lightning switches, and I can do that in my home, but it's also smart all the way down, and I don't have to put like a wireless LAN connector in every outlet. So I want to have wiring all the way. And you see on the right, there's the SSD relays. So four are down here, and another four are up here. And I just have to run like small wires to the SSD relays. And everything else works fine. Uh, you can also see a lane cable, which I run also to the uh, fuse box. But I did fuck up the uh, connector for the LAN connector. So. <laughs> I was like, it was my first project, and you got just stuff from the internet. It was like, oh, I've got a connector. It looks uh, like a LAN connector. Yeah, it would be fine. We'll be fine. It's a Word connector. Yeah, I've got a Word LAN box there. It's not the exact same model, but the footprint seems to fit. Would be fine. Yeah. I learned the hard way. Double check your footprints. I, I had to switch like four pins in there. Yeah. The first try is always a bad one, but. It works. It was also during chip shortage. I wanted to have SMD components, but I couldn't find the I.O. expander as SMD. So I had some lying around as DIP. I just used whatever I had. Um, I really like it. The, I mean, the schematics are really simple. It's just optocoupler, 
a resistor and a capacitor for like, having like a um, debuff, yeah, yeah de debounce. Um, and the out output is also the same thing. So a really small project for just like having the lightning in my home. And I think it's quite nice. And that's all. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, hello. Um, so uh, my talk's about a project in progress. Uh, I really like to talk about technology. Some uh, have uh, found themselves in this familiar situation. And we just keep talking and talking and recommending like great, great information to look up later. Um, and then I thought like, I really want to be able to give someone something so they can look it up when they are in their home. So um, uh, this is like a mock-up of it. It is a, it's a, a label printer attached to, uh, no, it's a receipt printer attached to my bag. So uh, while we're talking, the printer can uh, keep printing QR codes and great recommendations. And then afterwards, um, you can tear up the receipt and hand it like you talked with Inna. And uh, this is some Awesome stuff you might want to look up. Uh, the back I'm wearing is like a uh, mo moly system or a mole system. It's like a kind of an army bag and it has, uh, it's, very, it's very also like a lot of you might be familiar with it, uh, but it has like these straps uh, attached to it. And uh, those are to weave in uh, like these kinds of attach attachments. So that looks like this. Uh, so that way you can add like a small bag, and that small bag uh, fits uh, such a printer really, really well. Uh, this is my uh, demo setup for now. Uh, uh, friends of me call it uh, CAT, so cardboard aided design. Um, I found it really useful for the stuff to not like move all over the place. Uh, it uses a Parkside battery. Uh, so it's a bit fiddly to get it in, but it allows you to keep prototyping and uh, print more test receipts. Um, the printer I'm using is an uh, Adafruit printer. They sell like uh, four kinds. They sell, um, this one is the Nano, but they also sell the Tiny and the Mini. So the Nano is the smallest, and then the, the Mini is actually like a quite nice printer. You might also want to uh, incorporate in your projects. Um, Let's see. Uh, and I wanted to uh, give some remarks, because I learned already some things. It's not complete yet. Uh, but if you also want to play with these kind of printers, uh, Adafruit doesn't sell them anymore. So like other suppliers are also kind of running out. So if you can score them, they're still quite good. Um, the library is not like uh, maintained anymore, but it does work. Um, the main thing uh, you have to look is like uh, on the third line, that's how you call your, uh, your object, your printer. Uh, it uses the serial of your device, so you can look up that up in the pinout. And then um, there's like, they have uh, Adafruit has a tutorial on it. The last uh, number is like your extra secret pin that is in mine was already like connected with a wire. So the only thing to, uh, that I need to do uh, to speed it up 10 times was to add that number in it. And that wire was already connected because I just plugged them all in. Um, 
And then uh, before you can get started, you have to know if your printer is, uh, I think, L 1100, uh, 520 baud rate or uh, 9600. Uh, 9, and you have to edit that in the, the code of the library. So, but it's, it's actually quite readable. You, you will find the spot. But you have to know that you have to change this. Uh, you get, can get to know uh, what the printer is set up for if you uh, run the test print. So if you hold the power button on these printers, uh, they will give you like, hey, I'm this, I can do this, and uh, I'm still working. Uh, yeah, so hopefully I can get this project in the small bag at, at some point and then test it out, give it a test drive. Uh, so I'm actually pretty excited about it. Um, let's see, where can you find this project eventually? Uh, on my Hackaday.io page. Uh, I have like a, a, a URL, it links through to, the, to my Hackaday page, but you can also go to it directly. And uh, yes, that was what I wanted to share with you. Thank you. Okay, we got time for one more. Matt, you Okay, tiny tape out update and analog in three minutes. Three, two, one, go. What is tiny tape out? It's an easy way to make an ASIC. It's also very cheap. We combine hundreds of designs into one die. The biggest design is about 20,000 logic cells, and uh, we've got 26 IOs that can run up to about 50 megahertz. And we've got analog and mixed signal now. Uh, you get a board like this with the uh, ASIC already mounted. Uh, if anyone wants to check one of those out or check out the data sheet, the data sheet is awesome. This is a open source data sheet for an open source chip with everyone's projects on it. Absolutely awesome. Um, tiny tape out stats. So we've had about 800 people submit over the couple of years we've been going. I know some people here are disappointed they didn't make the workshop, but only 80 people have done workshops. The other 700 people have submitted without going to a workshop, so you don't need to wait for a workshop. Just go to the website. This is what the uh, submissions look like. There's five days left for Tiny Tape Out 6. Don't leave it to the last minute. You see what everyone else does. This is the shuttle map at the moment. That big one in the bottom right-hand corner is a Linux-capable RISC-V SOC. And all the green ones are analog projects. And I don't know if you can notice in the background, there's some little skulls there. We actually did tape them out. That's one of Uri's projects. This is a Skullfet inverter using Skullfet to make a logic inverter. And I, I got started with analog now. This is my first um, oscillator design. Should run at 2 megahertz, and it looks like this. There's some more capacitors down here. Uh, this is a 555 timer. Yes, 555 timer. Not by me. This is way, way more advanced. And this is a SAR A to D by Nordic Semi's principal IC scientist. So we're getting some good buy-in. Um, if you want to learn more, if you want to get on the wait list for my new analog course, then that's the QR code. Uh, or just talk to me afterwards. If anyone wants to check out the data sheet, just talk to me afterwards. Thanks very much for your time. end of this year's Hackaday Europe. Thank you all very much for being here. That was a crazy lightning talk. We almost got through them all, which is how we made a really good effort. So thank you all for being here. That was fantastic. Yesterday was fantastic. Badge hacking was fantastic. Like, I hope you all had a really, really good time. We've got to head on out of here. Bart, who is running the UV tape thing, has requested help for pulling tape. But go in there and look at it first, because I don't even know what's going on today. There is residual food on the way out the door. Grab some. There are also, I think, loads of extra AA batteries, if that's the sort of thing you're into. Um, so, you know, loot, loot and pill it. No. Um, grab some batteries and some food on your way out. Yep. 
We don't, we, no. We don't have time. Thank you, though. Yeah, what's up? Yeah, a couple, let's do a couple last minute announcements. What you got? All right, so people who did my workshop um, and got their um, lovely um, synthesizer badge thing that doesn't work. Um, I do, I d we did verify a fix yesterday to at least get it to work as a synthesizer. So um, if you, I'm going to document that on the GitHub for the project. Um, if you're coming at the end of this to the um, walk to Xhine, um, we can probably fix a few of them there. So, um, and also I have at least one extra badge enclosure for the large prototyping one if, one want, if anybody wants one. Thank you. Uh, yeah, thanks for putting that on, by the way. That was an awesome project. Last minute, let's see, other last minute news. Somebody gave Jenny an oscilloscope. Do you have the screws for the back of it? If so, give them to Jenny. Um, if anyone has seen Thea's uh, soldering iron, it's the pink one with our clear case RGB LEDs. If you can get it back to her real quick, that would be super awesome. We're still not found it. That's a bummer. Um, arts tape, arts tape art. Uh, Bart's tape art. Go on and help him take it down. Grab some food. We got batteries on the door, and you can congregate outside. I think some people are going over to Exhine with Dave. Otherwise, just hang out, mingle, and but uh, outside in the courtyard. We'll see you all there. Bye. <laughs>